This episode contains adult themes and is not appropriate for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, the world. This is They Will Kill, a true crime podcast. I am Courtney Heck. And I'm Sadie Heck. And it's Sadie's night tonight. And I went and caught myself a sty in the eye. Mm, that sty eye. <laughs> Hanging out with Sadie's uh, children at an indoor arcade where the germs are a poppin'. So that that's just my state of mind this week. Yeah. And I'm glad it's not my week because eye stuff takes over your whole face and your sinuses and your life and i'm worthless so eyes are so important yeah and that's all i got it's like cows you know it's their only defense (laughs) i'm like that it's like that's what i'm what i'm working with here is the big the big old baby blues and when one of them's compromised throws off my whole game we got nothing that's right so luckily it's not my week it's sadie's week you just close your eyes and i'll tell you a terrible story I will do it. Hey, but before I get started, stick around to the end for a promo from our friends at the World's Dumbest Criminals podcast. Woo! Sounds right up my alley. (laughs) Right? Don't be so hard on yourself. (laughs) (laughs) No, I mean, something I would like to do. I I would be the dumbest criminal, though, for sure. Oh, me too. 100%. All right. So we've got a little survival story. Oh, boy. All right. Yes. Uh, trigger warning for sexual assault and child abuse, but otherwise, okay. survival story. Yeah. This is The Boy in the Box, the survival story of Paul Martin Andrews. Oh, God. So I'm going to be pulling many quotes from an article written by the survivor and hero of our story. The article is titled Boxed In, A Boy's Lost Week, written by Paul Martin Andrews. All right. So Paul Martin Andrews, who goes by Martin was born in 1959 in Isle of Wight County, Virginia. He was the oldest of three siblings, and he described his early life as typical for the 60s and 70s, a latchkey kid through and through. Mm -hmm. With both parents working full-time, Martin and his siblings would get themselves ready for school in the morning and take care of themselves after school until their parents got home. Yep. When Martin was 12, his parents divorced, which was hard on all of them. A year later, Martin's mom remarried a widow who had three children of his own, and they moved into their new stepdad's home in Portsmouth, Virginia. Martin loved the move from the rural country to a bigger city with so many more options of places to go and things to do. Mm -hmm. Makes me think of you just always desperate to get out. (laughs) Get me out of this corn town is what I... (laughs) That's probably what he said. (laughs) Permanently thinking. Yep. Now I'm like, get me into a corn town. (laughs) Get me away from these people. (laughs) He would spend his free time at the movies and arcades. And when he started smoking, Martin realized he needed to get a job to support his new hobbies and habits. So he started working as a paper boy. You said when he started smoking? Yeah. Yep. He started smoking (laughs) and he was like, this is expensive. This is expensive. (laughs) Oh my God. It's so cute. (laughs) Yep. He enjoyed the work and the freedom his new income gave him. In the morning hours of January 10th, 1973, only six months after his family moved to Portsmouth, Martin was on his daily paper route. The day was cold and snowy. The streets were still covered in ice. So the 13-year-old put on ice skates and pulled his papers on a sled to get them delivered to his customers on time. Smoking and sledding. Yes. Skiing. Yes. Ice skating. So great. So cute. After delivering the papers, he went back home and learned school had been canceled that day, so he would be staying home and taking care of his younger siblings. As Martin was getting breakfast together, he realized they were out of milk, so he decided to walk to the nearby convenience store only four blocks away to get more. It should have only taken a few minutes, but Martin would not make it home that day. He would simply vanish. Uh -uh. When his parents returned home from work, they learned that Martin had been gone all day, and they were unable to find him themselves, so they called the police. Mm -hmm. Officers tried to convince Martin's mother he had run away and would come back on his own, despite her pleas that he was not the type of kid who would leave without telling her. 
that just every time gets me every, every time. time. I mean, I don't know if this probably happened. I mean, I know it still happens, but like especially in the seventies, it feels like yeah, kids. Yeah, just... thirteen. You were like an adult. They're like, well, yes. he probably went to college, or he's probably learning a trade the, on the, the mines. rail on the railroad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's not clear if an official search was launched for the boy, but I assume it's not likely. I couldn't really find any information at all about, like, nothing in the newspapers about him going missing. I really think they were just like, eh, run away. Yeah, he's getting, he got married, it's fine. Mm -hmm. He smokes, he's he's, he's got his pack, his marble rolls. He's got his marble reds and his bride, he's fine. Yeah. Eight days would pass, and with it, the hope of finding Martin alive was fading. That would all change when a group of rabbit hunters in the woods of rural Virginia heard someone screaming for help. Wow. As they approached the area where the sounds were coming from, they found a hole in the ground covered by a piece of tin. Oh my god. When they removed the tin, they found a teenage boy with two black eyes chained to the wall of a small underground box. Oh, what month is this? Oh, it's snowing. January. Snow month. Oh my god. January. Yep. The box was made out of plywood and two by fours, and it was about four feet high by four feet wide and eight feet long. Mm-mm. At the back of the box was a large shelf with canned food and supplies in it. There were sleeping bags on the floor. Martin had finally been found. Oh my god. Confused and scared, one of the hunters pointed his gun at Martin and ordered him to come out of the box. Martin explained he couldn't and showed the men the chain around his ankle. He told the hunters he'd been kidnapped and needed them to call the police. Oh my god. Martin would later write about how scared he was that these men would shoot him. Yeah. The hunter lowered his gun and told him to stay put until the police arrived. Jesus Christ. I mean, I get get it, I guess, but like, my instinct would not to be like pointing a gun at this poor kid in a hole in the ground yeah what, are you, also, what is he gonna so do shocking. yeah right. but yeah he's not gonna scramble up and get you <laughs> right he's not laying in wait for right. some unsuspecting hunter to yeah. pounce out of a hole guys <laughs> use your heads right and i think there was like three or four guys like grown men yeah so, anyway yeah i it, i mean it is the people who carry guns that have that sort of trigger instinct. reaction generally yeah, yeah. so When officers got to the scene, they took pictures of Martin chained in the box for evidence and then brought him to the hospital. Martin's mother worked at a hospital, and he remembers begging authorities to bring him there, but they refused. In his article, Martin writes, quote, My first memory of being at the hospital was sitting in a large examination room. I heard footsteps coming quickly down the hall and my mother's voice saying, Where is he? Where is he? I have the clearest memory of my mother running up to the police officer standing outside the door. Her knees were bent as she ran up to him, and I believe she was about to collapse. Yes. I jumped off the exam table and ran to her. She hugged me very hard. Oh, my God. Cannot be bothered to bring her to bring him to his mother. Right? I just can't. Ugh, there's all the, this story. It's 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 one of those. Yeah. They're, aren't they all? Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> Martin would spend the next few days being examined by doctors and questioned by police. Martin told detectives on the day he went missing, he had been on his way home from the store with his groceries and was only three blocks away when a blue van pulled up alongside him. Mm -hmm. The driver, an unassuming middle-aged man, asked Martin if he could help him move some furniture and offered to pay him for his help. Nope. Yep. Martin described himself as a, quote, precocious and verbal child, And said his parents didn't raise him to be seen and not heard. He was comfortable around adults and thought the man seemed, quote, honest enough. So he got in the van. Oh, no. He's got to get those cigs. Oh, no. The man introduced himself as Pee Wee, a name Martin later believed he picked to make himself seem weak and harmless. Right. As they started to drive, Martin became nervous and unsure if he'd made the right choice, but decided he was being silly. But the nervousness returned when he saw a long, wooden-handled knife inside the van. Yikesy. Yeah. To calm his nerves, Martin lit a cigarette, and Pee Wee said he smoked the same brand. The man then stopped at a grocery store and told Martin he was going to get supplies for his brother, whose house they were headed to. Pee Wee then left Martin and went to the store. 
quote, he left me alone in the van. And as I sat there, I suddenly had a strong desire to get out and run. But there were a number of reasons why I didn't. Mm -hmm. Firstly, I had no real idea where we were, except that we were somewhere near or around Suffolk. I was afraid of the trouble I would get into if my parents found out what I had done. And on some mm -hmm. level, I was afraid that he would think badly of me if I took off when he needed my help. Totally. I mean, mm -hmm. I would have done the same. Totally. Billion percent. Yes. I would do it now, let alone when I was 13. Yes. I hate disappointing people. Yeah. He's like, well, bah, definitely going to get stabbed with that knife, but let's just see how this plays out. Right. <laughs> yeah. So Martin stayed put. Oh, buddy. No. Pee Wee came back with several bags of food and a carton of Marlboro cigarettes, the kind they both smoked. Pee Wee kept Martin talking as they drove and asked him lots of questions about himself. When they finally pulled off the highway, Pee Wee became upset to find a chain across the dirt road he was trying to drive down. He said that it led to his brother's house. He told Martin they were going to have to walk to the house and get the key to unlock the chain. He asked Martin to come with him and help carry the supplies and said they were for his brother's deer box, which was on the way to the house. Mm -hmm. They walked only about 10 or 20 yards down the dirt road when Pee Wee said he forgot something. He told Martin to wait while he went back to the van. Martin could still see the van and watched as Pee Wee put something down the front of his pants. Mm. Martin said, quote, I was pretty sure it was the knife. I was getting really nervous, but I was unsure of what to do, and I still had a sense I was just overreacting. Mm -hmm. Nobody really expects the worst. No. <laughs> they walked about a quarter of a mile down the dirt road when Pee Wee stopped and pointed to a raised area about 30 yards from the road. He told Martin that that was his brother's deer box, but all Martin could see was a small piece of tin shaped like a pan that looked like it had been there for a long time. Pee-wee lifted the front edge of the tin to reveal a structure built into the ground and told Martin this was where his brother hid while he was hunting. Quote, I was relieved that some of what he had told me seemed to be true, and I thought that soon we would be on our way back to Portsmouth with a load of furniture. He went down into the box and had me hand him the supplies. Then he asked me to come down into the box to help him straighten it up. That seemed harmless enough, so I lowered myself into the box, Martin mm. said. Once in the box, Martin noticed the knife he had seen earlier was now sticking out of the support that held up the shelf in the back of the structure. Pee Wee asked Martin to move to the back of the box to help him shake out a blue tarp on the ground. Martin did as he was told, and Pee Wee ended up between Martin and the exit. Ugh. As they were folding the tarp, Pee Wee said, quote, I've got bad news for you. You've just been kidnapped. Oh my god. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Man. Martin said his blood ran cold, and he got the same scared feeling you get when you're caught in a lie. Yeah. Before Martin could react, Pee-wee laughed and said, Can't you take a joke? I'm just kidding. But you'll have to stay here until this afternoon. This was the last straw for Martin, who had had enough and was sufficiently scared. He took yeah. a defensive pose and told the older man he would hurt him if he got anywhere near him. Pee-wee told Martin he was scaring him, which then caused Martin to drop his guard. And that's when Pee Wee attacked the boy. Oh, buddy, no. No, poor Martin. He's just like, I cannot imagine how confused and like how you just suddenly find yourself in this very scary, strange yep. place. Like, yep. And you got yep. this master manipulator dude. Like, totally. I would never, that's, I mean, like Pee Wee to be like, oh no, now you're scaring me. It's, I would have never think to do something, you know? Like, that's totally. so fucked up. Totally. Yeah. Uh, and he's clearly a bright kid, super yeah. smart and on his shit and just like up for Personable. anything. Yeah. yeah. And trusting and just would assume that it's all going to be okay. And even if it's mm -hmm. not, he can, he'll, he'll be okay. He'll make right. himself be okay. Yeah. Ugh, Cause but... what person in the right mind would dig a hole in the ground to, to, to lure a child into, yeah, you know, in your like, town. No. Right. Right. Martin was shocked at how strong Pee Wee was. Quote, all at once he grabbed me and pulled me to him. As I was fighting to get free, I reached for the knife, but he had me pretty well restrained. Then he hit me and I stopped struggling. Mm -hmm. He warned me that if I ever tried to touch the knife again, he would kill me. That knife has always haunted me over the years. It was a good sized knife, about 12 inches long, mm. with the brand name Old Hickory burned into the wood handle. 
Mm. When I saw a set of knives made by the same company in the grocery store about five years later, I was instantly filled with fear and wanted to run out of the store. I bet. I avoided that aisle for a long time after that. To this day, I'm instantly reminded of the incident and the fear whenever I see one of those knives. Yeah. Once he had Martin subdued, he forced him to remove his clothes. Oh, and here, we're, I'm not going to get real graphic, but it, you know, just yeah. heads up, trigger warning. He had forced him to remove his clothes and the sexual assault and rape began. Martin says he was raped by Pee Wee at least three times a day for the week he was held captive. Mm. He did his best to keep his attacker talking. He thought maybe if he kept Pee Wee distracted, he wouldn't touch him, but it didn't help very much. Mm. There were times Martin was allowed out of the box and the two would spend time exploring the woods and would cook out by the campfire Pee Wee built. Wow. Quote, outside we cooked by campfire and explored the woods. I remember remarking that outside of the box, it was very much like a regular camping trip. Wow. Martin remembered Pee Wee asking him what he thought of the sexual attacks. And when Martin told him he thought he was sick and needed help, Pee Wee acted disappointed. So he's like very, very developmentally delayed. Pee Wee? Yes. Yeah. Or just like fucked up. I don't know. I, I don't know. Well, I mean, obviously fucked up, but, you mm-hmm. know, pr- treating him like a bud. Yeah. And yeah. hoping that he likes it, you know, mm-hmm. that's, that's, yeah, that's yeah. a lot. There was also a lot of, like, I mean, in some of the more, in the article that Martin wrote himself, there's a lot of details, like, um, question, he'd ask him questions like, is this your first time doing things Ugh. like this? And when Martin yeah. said no, then it made Pee Wee mad. And yep. uh, Martin once commented how he the assaults didn't happen outside. And so then Pee Wee raped him outside, just like really Jesus. fucked up. Yep. Yeah. As the week dragged on, the initial thrill of the abduction and its sexual assault seemed to wear off for Pee Wee, and he became more angry and aggressive. Mm-hmm. Quote, once I tried to make a deal with him about the sexual abuse and he made it clear that he was in control and would do as he pleased. Another time for no reason other than to terrorize me, he threatened to strip me naked and chain me to a tree Mm. where he said he would whip me until I bled, allowing the cold to freeze my wounds, and then he would return to do it again. Mm. When I pleaded with him not to do that, he laughed and said, can't you take a joke? God, this guy. It also became clear that Pee Wee had gone to great lengths and had spent a long time planning to abduct Martin, and if not him, someone else for sure. Totally. It was also clear he had abused other children, and he'd even shown him a picture of two brothers he said he had molested in the past. Mm-hmm. Martin believed that for as much time Pee Wee had spent planning the abduction, he had spent very little, if any time, planning for what would happen when it was time to leave. Yep. If Pee-wee had planned that part as well as he'd planned the abduction, Martin would have surely been killed by his abductor. Yep. Martin said, quote, He began to talk about getting me home. He gave me two choices. The first was he would take me back and I would tell my parents I had run away. If I agreed to do that and went through with it, he would send me a money order for $50. He also said someone would be watching me to see if I called the police, and I would need a bodyguard if I took his money and went back on my word. Yeah, this guy is, I mean, of course, but he's like a kid. Yeah, right. You know, those are are things that kids say. Right. You need a bodyguard. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be watching you. My second choice was for him to leave me in the box and contact my mother to let her know where I was so she could come pick me up. He told me not to expect her until the next day, so he'd have time to get away. He gave mm-hmm. me four hours to decide. I chose the second option. Mm-hmm. After Martin made his choice, Pee Wee bound his hands and feet with wire and moved him to the center of the box. Without any warning, he began to beat Martin in the face. Mm. Pee Wee was furious that the boy had not taken the first option. Wow. Quote, as he beat me, he kept asking why I hadn't chosen the first option. He accused me of being a goody-goody. All I can remember saying was I was sorry. I testified at trial he began crying so hard that he had trouble untying my hands. Mm -hmm. I tried to convince him I was willing to go through with the first option, but he didn't believe me. Mm -hmm. A week after taking Martin, Pee Wee told him he was leaving, and if he stayed any longer, he would probably end up killing him. 
Mm-hmm. When night fell, Pee Wee got his things together and chained Martin by the ankle to a wall in the box. He left his hands free. I mean, it really is astounding to me that Pee Wee didn't try to kill Martin. Well, and that's what makes me think, too, that he really wanted a buddy. Mm-hmm. You know, like he didn't think it through. He was like, I'm going to have this person yeah you know kind of like a like when you're a mother and you're like we're gonna be best friends Mm -hmm. and you know you have these Mm -hmm. expectations for how something's gonna play out and then they don't play out that way Mm -hmm. you know and maybe some part of him you know he wasn't a murderer like he really wanted like a pen pal buddy kind of you know obviously there was sexual motivation clearly that was a main motivation but just wanting for it to be reciprocated Mm -hmm. and of course it's not (laughs) you know of course it's not but it does seem like in his mind it was going to be he could make this work yeah yeah it's tragically fucking fucked up Mm -hmm. he asked for martin's mother's phone number and told him he would call her and tell her where martin was and that she would need to bring bolt cutters to free him Mm -hmm. martin says quote just as he was getting ready to leave he turned to me and said I've got to have that one more time. Ugh. And he raped me again. Uh. The next morning, I awoke early in anticipation of my mother's arrival. I tried to pull the chain from the wall, but it was fastened securely. Then I found a pair of fingernail clippers he'd left, and I started trying to cut through the chain. It was slow work, but I was making progress. Wow. Yeah. I don't Fingernail like, clippers. Like, why? Yes. Right? Like, it why? Was, yeah. It was these marks in the chain that I used to identify it at trial. I never really thought about the possibility of dying in the box. In my mind, I was on the way to freeing myself. Mm -hmm. Also, for some reason, I never imagined the possibility of him just outright killing me. Pretty soon, I heard the sound of a vehicle coming. I was certain it was my mother because I could hear the shifting of gears. My mother owned a Plymouth Duster with a three-speed manual transmission. But he had never called her. When I saw it wasn't my mother, but some sort of truck, I began to yell and scream, mostly profanities. I'm always reminded of this when I watch The Silence of the Lambs and the girl in the pit screams profanities at Jodie Foster as she's being rescued. (laughs) So back at the hospital, once Martin was finished telling authorities his story, they left and came back with a photo lineup. They asked Martin to identify the man who had kidnapped him, and without hesitation, he picked 33-year-old Richard Alvin Osley from the lineup Mm -hmm. it turns out the detectives already knew who they were after they just wanted martin to confirm it what owsley was a repeat offender who lived in martin's neighborhood what Mm -hmm. police had suspected martin had been abducted the whole time but led his parents to believe he'd run away Uh, 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 why why easier court (laughs) oh my god (laughs) On the day Martin was abducted, Owsley had been scheduled to appear in a Portsmouth courtroom on a sodomy charge, which involved a 14-year-old boy, and he was on parole after serving 10 years in prison for the 1961 abduction of a 10-year-old boy who he lured away from a recreation center by asking him to help him fix his car. You gotta be fucking kidding me. No. Nope. Once he had what? this boy in his car, he hogtied him, raped him, and left him in the woods. Oh my god you guys oh i mean i think that there's a certain amount it's got to be like you know that you didn't do your job properly and so it's happened again and so you're like well just uh Mm -hmm. run away run away yeah like (laughs) we probably should have made sure he was still in jail somehow Mm -hmm. but no he's done it again so man yeah Mm mm-hmm There was a family that would later come forward and tell authorities that three of their children had been molested by Owsley for years. Got to be kidding me. Nope. Martin would later write, quote, Here was a repeat offender living in my neighborhood, missing on the very day he was supposed to go back to court for abusing a child. Another child comes up missing from the same area that very day, and nobody put it together. If they did, they did not tell my parents. God. I mean, they just, like, children were just not protected no. or thought of as children back no, then. No, they were not, no, they were not you know, precious by any means. Well, and we've talked about it before. It's like <laughs> that great line from Bo Burnham, like, 
when his father was 20 or when his grandfather was 26, he was fighting in the war. And when he was 26, he was making a birdhouse with his mom. (laughs) (laughs) So true. You know, I I get it. They're like, Mm -hmm. yeah, I literally was working in a coal mine when I was your age. So (laughs) you're fine. (laughs) But still, God. Yes. (sighs) Yep. So Owsley would be arrested and charged with the abduction, kidnapping, and multiple counts of rape against Martin. He pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 48 years in prison. That's it. That's it. Yep. For yeah. multiple, uh, multiple kidnappings, multiple t- sexual assaults, multiple, multiple. Yep. God. Yeah. You want to make sure that he does it again? Give him 48 years. Seriously. In a jailhouse interview, Owsley told reporters that he was the real victim and that Martin had wanted to be there in the box with him. See? Yeah, yeah. this guy's got some serious fucking Mm -hmm. pathology Mm -hmm. quote my life was over marty saw to that i will be his victim for the rest of my life or his you can go fuck yourself although justice may have been served in some ways the victimization of martin had only begun i'm sure martin's parents his doctors and the police all believed martin was broken by what had happened to him Mm-hmm. And it's more, less his parents, more that the doctors and police talked his parents into believing this. Yep. Quote, I had did nothing to precipitate their opinion, but the police convinced my parents I might become a threat to the other children and act out on them sexually. Oh, you're kidding me. No. Oh, no. Yes. Everyone recommended they at least put me into psychotherapy, and many recommended that I be placed in an institution. Oh my god. Mm -hmm. What had I done? Why was I being punished? Oh no. Yep. Martin would be put into a locked psychiatric ward for treatment. Found the treatment to be unsettling and unhelpful at best, and re-traumatizing at its worst. Yep. After he was released, he spent a few years self-medicating and struggled with alcohol and drug use, and credits his relationship with God as what helped him out of his darkest moments. Oh my god. As the years passed, Martin did what he could to move on and live his best life. He would become a computer programmer and would eventually move to Miami. Yeah, get to Miami. Yeah, right? Martin stayed very quiet about his survival story and didn't even share many of the details of what happened to him with his life partner of more than 20 years. Mm-hmm. This would all change in 2002 when Martin learned that Owsley was getting ready to be released after serving only 30 of the 48 years of his sentence. Of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't give him a 48-year sentence. That's nothing. Mm -hmm. No. Despite being a well-known pimp in prison, quote, these are quotes, pimp Mm -hmm. in prison, and continuing to be a master manipulator and liar. It sounds like Owsley just loved prison. He did... You know, he was sort of the king of yeah, that he's whole got all, world. All the buddies he needs, all the buddies he mm-hmm. wants, and they can't go anywhere. They're mm-hmm. all stuck in there with him, and he can do whatever mm-hmm. he wants to them. It's yep. like the perfect place for a creep like that. Yep. In 1999, Virginia had passed the, quote, Sexually Violent Predators Act, which allowed the state to keep violent sexual predators locked up in state-run hospitals after they were released from prison. Uh-huh. But the state never allocated any funding to the program, so it hadn't been used. (laughs) Martin decided to change that. He took all of his paid time off and began making frequent trips to Virginia to lobby top state officials and tell his story to the media. Yeah, Martin. Mm -hmm. All in an effort to prevent the scheduled release of his attacker. He also convinced another victim of Owsley's to come forward with his story, which resulted in him being convicted of child sex abuse and sentenced to an additional five years so that Martin could continue to lobby the state without the worry of his abuser being released. Good. I mean, I hate that they have to do this. It's fucking Mm -hmm. absurd that victims have to lobby for themselves and do this themselves, but good. Good for you. Yes. Yep. His efforts paid off when he was able to meet with the governor of the state of Virginia and the governor would eventually agree to put $300,000 toward the program. Good. They planned to have Owsley be the first inmate to be enrolled in the program. But before this could all be put into place, Owsley was found dead in his prison cell on January 13th, 2004. Mm-hmm. 
An autopsy showed that he had been strangled and suffered blunt force trauma to his torso. His cellmate, Dewey Keith Venable, would eventually confess to the murder. Venable was a victim of sexual assault himself as a child and had been raped once while in prison. Mm -hmm. He had pleaded with prison officials not to place him in a cell with a sex offender and had already been disciplined twice for problems he had with sex offenders during his incarceration. Yep. It was no real surprise that someone like Owsley would push Venable to the edge. Martin said, quote, I did nothing to deserve what Richard Owsley did to me. We may not be able to say the same of Richard Owsley. I mean, the fact that he made it that long without getting killed, mm-hmm. honestly. Yes. Know, as a yep. sex, child sex offender in prison. Yeah. Well, and as part of his, so he had been moved when he got those um, additional five years He was moved from, like, a pretty mellow prison to really high security Uh prison for real bad dudes. Uh (laughs) And so some of the articles I read talked a lot about that, how he, and he, uh, Owsley could have asked to be put into segregation to keep himself safe, but he'd like to be in the general population. Right. And thought, you know, nobody would hurt him. And so sort of, like, the things that he had available to him, he didn't, he chose not to do. Right. Uh, but Martin also wasn't sure how to feel about the murder. Quote, I'm still very conflicted and I'm trying to come to terms with it. Yep. I did what I did to keep him off the street. Nobody deserves to be murdered. Yep. Martin continues to fight for victims of sexual abuse and still lobbies for the v- Sexually Violent Predators Act, which some Virginia legislators were looking to turn over in 2021. Yep. Quote, I needed to remind people that this story happened, these horrifying things are happening to children, and that sex offenders roam freely after committing multiple crimes. If you allow, they will do it again, he says. Yeah, and they're they're untreatable. But yeah. Right. I think mm-hmm. sort of conclusively that's Well, I think that yeah, that there's a lot about you know, there's a lot a lot of back and forth between people saying this is double jeopardy, that once somebody has done their time they need to be let out. And right. uh, other people are saying, no, there are certain types of sexual predators that their rate they of continue to mm-hmm. reoffend. Yeah, it's like forever. 85% or some, uh, like there's a, there's a test that you can take uh, yep. that they, they can be given that will say like, yeah, their, their chances of committing more crimes are very, very high. And it's those people that they're trying to mm-hmm. keep. Yeah, uh, stay in in treatment yeah since uh having getting funding for this program in virginia i think they said there's right now like 400 people in uh the state hospitals that would have otherwise been released wow it's a lot of people yeah that's a ton of people mm-hmm. Ugh. Yep. Ugh. so that's it that's the story oh Little martin martin andrews i know martin oh my heart breaks for martin yeah that- I mean, sounds like he's perseveres. He's a badass who's after it. But mm-hmm. God, man, leave the kids alone. Seriously, you shouldn't just, have to do any of that. No. And he's just out there being a little badass, smoking his cigs and solving problems and S- earning money, taking care of his siblings. No. Being a Ice little... skating down the road with his sled full yeah. of newspapers. <laughs> I mean, ugh. Yeah. My heart. Mm-hmm. I'm so glad he survived. God, me too. <laughs> me too. And how lucky that the hunters came the day he could be, yeah. you know, like freed and. Yep. 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 Boy. Good one, dude. Thanks. I watched the 2020 on Gabby, Gabby Petito last night. Just speaking of things lining up just right. How was that? It's good. I mean, I thought, you know, we watched it just in case there was something we didn't know. And right. you, you pretty much know everything, you know, but it is still just so interesting the way the, the other blogger passed her. You know, it was like so was all these bloggers out there just blogging and running into each other and videotaping everything. And it's just like, I, it, it's just such a crazy case for that reason for me. I mean, for really so is. many reasons, but that whole part of it is just remarkable. Yeah. That case is just so crazy. It's so crazy. It's so crazy and so senseless. I mean, yep. my God, just these kids out there and just, ugh. Yeah. <laughs> I still want to get to the bottom of how Laundry's how parents found his remains. It's just all, it's so crazy. It's so crazy. And how his remains were just 
bones by the time they got mm-hmm. to him and his backpack was fine and mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. yep yeah, there's more to, there's more to uncover i think yeah it sure seems like it right what anyway. do you guys think Nobody has an opinion know. about that case. Like everyone's <laughs> just like, oh, who cares? Not, I'm not interested. <laughs> Nobody cares. Uh, do you have names for us today? I do. I was going to say the one thing you are interested in, ravenously interested in, is sending me names and don't ever stop. Don't ever stop. You guys. <laughs> Someone said there's a legendary name from their middle school that a teacher named Mrs. Ball and her husband's name was Harry. <laughs> ball i feel like my our mother knows somebody named something ball i don't think it was harry ball but there's like a larry ball anyway i don't know because our mother's maiden name was whore h-o-a-r yeah so Mm -hmm. it was like her margaret whore and larry ball always hung out with each other (laughs) (laughs) uh we have a cute teacher name Connie Pettyjohn. Oh my God. I know. So cute. She's in a wooden bathtub with a cap on and a wooden scrubber. (laughs) Where's Connie? Where's Connie Pettyjohn? Well, she's in the wooden bathtub, of course. (laughs) With her bonnet. You know? Yeah. Scrubbing down with lye. Lye (laughs) soap. Um, There's Sandra Claus. I mean, what if Santa Claus is a lady and it's Sandra Claus? It's been Sandra Claus all these years and we thought it was Santa Claus. Right. Right? Yes. Um, Ruby Lust got married and became Ruby Stone. (laughs) (laughs) She had a great run with that name. Can't go wrong. Just upgrading. Yeah. (laughs) Like, I don't know, like more like a, what is that called? Parallel... Promotion. Yeah, lateral shift lateral. or whatever. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> lateral move from Ruby Lust <laughs> to Ruby Stone. Um, there's a guy named Jack Russell. From, I think he's from The Bachelor. I think yes. I, somebody said this. He's from The Bachelor. Uh, Jack Russell. Jack Russell. <laughs> oh, come on, people. Come on, parents. Seriously. There's a Richard Shield. So we got a Dick, <laughs> Dick Shield. Dick Shield. <laughs> there is a train... Named Dick Mabut. <laughs> oh, oh my god! Is that I like think, is that like I, the Bo- Bodie Bodie McBoat Bo- face? Yeah. I don't know. I think it's from Australia. Dick Mabut. <laughs> M A B U T T. That's so funny. Uh, Ryan sent me a list of great grandchildren from an obituary. Get this. Get a load of these guys. I oh, can't wait. Bentley, Bryson, Brinley, Kinsley, Kendall, Kennedy, Baylor, Brody, Collie, and Lance. What? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Say them again. Bentley, Bryson, Brinley, Kinsley, Kendall, Kennedy, Baylor, Brody, Collie, K O L L Y, and Lance. Or <laughs> Lance. <laughs> what? Where did Lance? <laughs> wow, what? Lance. Lance. <laughs> um, halfway in between Fairbanks and Nanana, Alaska, there's a store called Skinny Dicks Halfway In. Oh, you. <laughs> God. <laughs> oh, God. Do they only uh, sell Big Johnson shirts? <laughs> there, I, I guess there's a lot of uh, phallic paraphernalia to be purchased at skinny (laughs) dicks have they in (laughs) Uh, um somebody's daughter went to school with a girl named absidy spelled a b c d e Uh. (laughs) absidy and her son went to school with an epiphany that's a great name such a good name I have a friend named Freedom. Epiphany would be a, another a good sibling for Freedom. Yes. Um, in San Diego, there's a sign that says Gregory Winner, which feels kind of condescending to me. So, <laughs> Gregory, Gregory Winner. <laughs> Here's a sign for you. <laughs> and that's it, you guys. That's that it. is it. <laughs> what else do you need? Nothing. Dick no. my butt. <laughs> All aboard. <laughs> All aboard, uh, Dick, my butt. First stop, 
skinny dicks halfway in. <laughs> oh, God. God. It makes so me gross. very uncomfortable. Yes. I know. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> uh, well, Should we play the promo? Yeah, let's do the quick and promo. Some, and then we'll do, do some, some shout outies. outies. Yep. Fuck yeah. Here you guys go. Listen to Sadie's new podcast about her own self. <laughs> World's dumbest criminals. Did you hear about the Welsh tourists who got drunk and stole a penguin named Dirk from SeaWorld on the Gold Coast? Or the Canadian guy who tried to beat a breathalyzer test by eating his own underpants? Hey, I'm Tara Saraban from World's Dumbest Criminals, an upbeat podcast about deadbeat crims. Join me every Monday to hear about the most ridiculous, bizarre and downright stupid crimes and criminals in the world ever. Like the Australian man who put out an unsuccessful hit on his wife and freaked out when she crashed her own funeral. Or the Chinese woman who deliberately ran 49 red lights in her ex-boyfriend's car. World's Dumbest Criminals is available on iTunes, Spotify and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. Make sure you subscribe if you don't want to miss any criminally stupid shenanigans. All right, let's do some Patreon shout them out. Outies. Yes, you. Hey, you can be a member of this group too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Stadium to sell sells it so yeah. well every time. Do it. Three dollars a month, or five, or ten, or twenty. Your yep. choice. You get more goodies as the money goes up. <laughs> yeah, I want to start with thanking Catherine R. Catherine R, as in rock around the clock. Catherine <laughs> rocks right the fuck around the clock. She's just rocking and rolling all night long. I'm <laughs> shimming a bit on it, I'm singing a song. <laughs> Beep boop boop boop. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> I just took a drink of coffee. <laughs> I just spit it everywhere. Almost died. Don't die. Uh, thank oh, you. Oh, and I promised tarot oh. for this round. I didn't bring a tarot deck. We'll do tarot <gasps> next round. Courtney. Yep. Yeah, we'll do it next time. And if any of you, if anybody of you, you signed up specifically to get a tarot reading, I will happily redo yours next That's time because right. I made I made a promise and I did not follow <laughs> through on it. Uh, thank you so much to Melissa, no last name given, from Canada. Melissa from Canada. That's uh, you know, there's a legend of Melissa from Canada, and she came down from Mount and. Upon dissension, she found a small box, and when she opened it, inside it said one word. Do you know what that word was? No. Booyah. <laughs> yes. And that is the legend of <laughs> Melissa from Canada. Uh. <laughs> and legend has it that if you listen to the winds on the... Eastern of Maro, you will hear Melissa shout, Booyah! <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much to Uner. <laughs> That's not exactly. Yep. Yep. Uner? I don't Uner? know. I am I am loving it. Whatever it is, you how you spell it. U N N U R. Uner? Uner. <laughs> That it's is, not, I mean, and the last name, I'm not even going to admit it's, it. Where is our new friend from? I don't know. No, no address given. What? Yeah. Just this mysterious Uner just sliding in, giving yes. us money every month. What? Yes. yes. Uner. Uner is mythical. Please tell us how to pronounce your name. Uner is magical. Uner, Uner, like, changes matter. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? From like totally. solids to gases. Like one of those then, atom colliders. Yeah. And then bottles it and then gives it to people in a time of need. Like yes. just show up like somebody's struggling with a bad relationship and Uner's like, take this. You'll know what to do. <laughs> and it works. And then that person goes on to become like an inventor of something very obscure <laughs> and very successful. Yes. I love Thanks, it. Uner. Thank right? you. Yes. You want Uner's potions? Yes. You just you suck it in out Done. of a little vial, a little glass vial, and then you save the glass vial because it's attractive and it can be used as just like a decorative piece on your mantle. Yes. 
Love and it. it rules. You know who else rules? Cassie T. Cassie T. Cassie T. Cassie T. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Cassie T. Oh, Cassie T. Out there. R- real in the wild, wild west. And just yeah. out there with the uh, slinging and kicking open those little swingy doors. Yep. And... You know, the boys are like, oh, Cassie T, get, go on out of here. You go play with the girls. And Cassie T's like, don't worry about it. I'm going to beat all your asses and I'm going to rob all the bags. I'm going to be the one. and Don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm Cassie T. Shoots, her, shoots Cassie T on the side of a bank with a machine gun. <laughs> For no reason. Doesn't even rob it. Just brand. Just tags Achoo. it. Early tagger. <laughs> <laughs> Smoking Marlboros. Flicking them. <laughs> That's old Cassie T. <laughs> uh, thank you so much to Mary G. Cassie T. Good. Ding. Don't worry about it. It shows up in like old timey script. <laughs> Bang. That's her tagline. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Who are we on to next? <laughs> Mary G. Marigold. Uh, mm-hmm. uh-huh. She's Marigold. Yeah. Which is, uh, everyone knows Marigolds are perennials. And you know what that means. They last forever. They That's literally, right. their gold gloriousness goes on forever. It's vibrant. It's ever, always. Right. It is vast. It's Everyone likes to look at you. They make um, they make things out of you, like uh, blankets for weddings. <laughs> <laughs> they the name hotels after you. You, you know, keep like the pests away from vegetables in your garden. <laughs> they uh, make romantic comedies about people going to the hotel later in life and falling in love i don't know if they're perennials i don't think they are at all i think they like no are idea. pretty quick but they're so pretty yes right isn't there a movie called like the last marigold hotel or some bullshit I have like no that? idea anyway so, anyway thank you mary gold thank you mary gold and last but not least, we got N W. Yeah, we do. And N and W. And she's coming down to Cassidy's house. And they're gonna shoot some moles with their guns. <laughs> and they're gonna rustle up some grub. <laughs> and they're gonna shoot some shit like talk to each other. Yeah. And don't worry about it. <laughs> yes. Thanks, you guys. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so for much. being here. Uh, you guys, you can always come hang out with us on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter at They Will Kill. You can go to our website, theywillkill.com. You can email us at theywillkillpodcast at gmail.com. Yes, thank you. No, rate, review, subscribe. Please, Please. rate, review, subscribe. Please. We've got two one stars right in a row. Go ahead and bury them on down. Bury Bury them on down. Don't, don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Just bury them on down. Yep. Thank you, AJ Bergens, for your music. Thank you so much. And remember, mm, don't touch your eye if you go to an arcade to get a sty in it and then your day's bummed out. Yeah, mm, dude. You lose your superpowers of having big eyes that are disarming. <laughs> and then you just look like Quasimodo face. Nobody wants We love that. you guys. Yeah, we do. Yes, heck yes, we do. We love you, and we'll see you real soon. We'll see you next time. See you next time. Goodbye. Goodbye.